Hello, everyone, and welcome. We're now beginning our Fredrickson and Byron Health Law Webinar, Legal and Business Tips for Negotiating an EMR EHR Contract. I'm Steve Helland. I'm a partner here at Fredrickson, and I chair our technology, internet, and e-business group. Uh, I've got close and good working relations with all the members of our health law group, uh, in large part because uh, electronic health record or electronic medical record systems are right now probably the single biggest piece of work I do in my practice. Uh, so with that, let's begin. I want to, by way of overview, make two uh, starting comments. Number one is to thank my clients. Uh, th there are some things that I learn as a lawyer through uh, book learning and reading articles and trade journals. There are others that I learned from the School of Hard Knocks. And uh, I've done a few dozen of these contracts now for systems. And, uh, and I learned a ton from working with my clients collaboratively. So uh, those of you, there are a few I know listening right now, uh, you know who you are. Thank you for uh, the wisdom and uh, shared learning we've had on this topic. Number two is this will be more interesting both for me and hopefully for you uh, if you uh, send me questions. Uh, I think that, that can be done by email <coughs> and possibly some other chat function, a chat function over on the uh, window that you have. So feel free to send those in any time. Uh, and if for some reason I don't answer your question during this live component of the webinar, uh, that's because maybe it's a specialized question or there's some other issue, but I'll call you after the webinar and follow up then. Goals for the next hour. Uh, we've got 60 minutes to cover a complex topic. Uh, what I want to do is demystify the legalistic, techie, and intellectual property portions of an EMR, EHR contract, and as you can tell, I'm using those terms uh, interchangeably. Next is identify the key sections and issues. The last, uh, actually the, the EHR contract I was looking at earlier today was 60 pages long, uh, single spaced. So obviously we're not gonna get through every single issue during this one hour meeting. But in my experience working on these things, there are really a limited number of sections that have the most significant impact on fees, on your business relationship. I also see on the other end of the equation, when, uh, when I look at cases where there's litigation or, or deals gone badly wrong, it's not over every single issue or a random distribution of issues. It's really a, a finite set of particular issues that keep cropping up again. So those are the ones I'm going to talk about. Also, I'll note that, that when you're negotiating, you have to pick your battles. And in a, in a document that long, you're going to have limited negotiation time. Uh, if you go too many rounds, what some of my colleagues up in the mergers and acquisitions department call deal fatigue is going to set in. Uh, so I really want you to focus your time and negotiations on those issues that are going to have a more concrete impact. Next and last, in terms of the overall goals, because this is such an applied specific presentation, uh, I want to give you tips to save money, protect against legal and business risk, and last, promote legal compliance. All right, before we dive into the nitty-gritty specific terms, there are a few things that I think set the stage for, uh, for successful negotiations. Whether you're a small uh, clinic or a small practice or you're a large hospital chain or provider, uh, these are largely the same. I'm sure there are other things beyond this, but again, these are, in my experience, the most critical items to set the stage for successful negotiations. Uh, the first one, don't narrow the list of candidate vendors to a single one at the time you go move into contract negotiations. Keep at least one or more in reserve and let whoever you're negotiating with at that time know that there's someone in reserve. You don't have to be heavy-handed about it, but make it clear that it's not a deal until you've actually finished negotiations and signed paper at the end. Anyone who's sold a car or a house or has done a lot of negotiations you know that the entire dynamic of the negotiation will change if there's only one bidder or one buyer. Uh, when, there, when there's one bidder, that person is invited to make you know, low ball bids uh, and not be helpful. Whereas if there's someone else waiting in the wings, in this case uh, a secondary EHR vendor uh, who's hungry for the deal, the, the primary vendor that you're negotiating with, uh, is gonna, that's going to keep them honest. Next, uh, end of the quarter and end of the year will help you. I had read somewhere that, was it in Consumer Reports, saying that something like the, you know, the, the Wednesday before the end of the month is the best time to buy a car or a used car. I have no idea if that, if that is true. Uh, I know for a fact that the end of the quarter or the end of the year will significantly help you in closing your EHR deal. 
Uh, I've been amazed at issues that have kind of stalled out or the vendor said no to, that when we park those issues, whether it's maybe you know, an additional discount on the fees, maybe it's an, an, uh, you, know, you throw in an extra year of maintenance and support at a fixed fee or a discounted fee, maybe it's a legal term or two that were real sticklers earlier on that were important to us. Um, when we parked those and the end of the quarter was coming up and the vendor really wanted to book the deal before the end of the quarter, I've been amazed, frankly, at the level of concessions my clients have been able to get. Whether it's a public company or a private company, all of these uh, vendors are competing heavily for market share. There's a lot of vendors in the industry right now. There's talk, you know, is there going to be shakeout? Uh, not all of these will survive. And so whether they're public or private, there's, there's huge pressure on the sales teams to deliver uh, quarterly numbers. And so you can use that to your advantage. The related comment is that it's okay to park the short list of toughest issues until the very end. I find that what can be a very successful negotiating strategy or tactic is, like I say, for it has to be a handful. I'll say, you know, less than five, preferably two, you know, one, two, or three issues that are really important to you that the vendor just says no to, to park those if you want to. And so that at the end of negotiations, everything else is ready to go. You can say to your uh, primary contact or salesperson, look, we are prepared to sign on the dotted line and make an initial payment to you, but we need these one, two, or three things. That really crystallizes the issue and that can help you move the ball forward in getting those items that you couldn't get earlier on when you know, there were 20 issues or 40 issues outstanding. Finally, rushing negotiations will, will hurt you. Uh, in my experience, when clients have come and you know, they're just beginning negotiations two weeks before the end of the quarter and everyone's agreed that we're going to finish it before the end of the quarter or the end of the year, uh, or the client has some other timetable that they need to meet. Um, doing it that fast, y you don't get to think through the issues clearly. You only have time to do a more limited number of rounds of negotiation. I you can get something done in that time frame if you have to, so I'm not saying you know don't negotiate at all, but that Two weeks or less is, is just not, to my mind, a good time frame. Uh, one to two months, I would say, is, is typical. And two months, leading more towards two months is going to, I think, lead a better result of lead time for you. Next, uh, involve multiple stakeholders from your own team. Right, obviously, these are all the folks who are going to use it, the folks who are going to pay for it. I'll note here in a gratuitous plug for uh, whether you're using uh, internal or external legal support, uh, please include legal, uh, preferably earlier rather than later. In the early rounds as you're designing your RFP or thinking about vendor selection, legal probably doesn't have too much to say and uh, you shouldn't get billed for too much tr attorney time. But there will be a few points that bear upon the RFP and early on in the vendor selection process. Next, uh, I do strongly recommend an RFP and an RFP response as part of the early process. And for reasons that'll become clear later as we talk about warranties, I strongly recommend you include a clause such as I've included a sample here. You know, your or the vendor's response to the RFP will be incorporated into the final contract documents and we will require that the software slash system is warranted to perform in conformance with the RFP response. All legal terms supplied by the vendor in the RFP response are rejected. Um, so as part of your RFP, right, you and your team should be formulating a list of needs or expectations of the system in plain English. And I, I'm kind of underlining plain English in my notes here uh, on the paper. So often what the vendor's materials will have is written in more technical mumbo jumbo. And it might even be clear to your IT folks, but we want kind of very clear yes, no statements. Can your system do X, Y, and Z? We want those answers then captured not just by the salesperson talking to you but in, a, in an RFP response and we're going to incorporate that into the uh, agreement documents so that you can really hold the vendor's feet to the fire. That's, I can't underemphasize the importance of, of that piece of this in terms of making sure that you get the value that you think you're paying for in this expensive project. Next, uh, the goal is to improve the contract, not perfection. Right? What's the old saying? You know, don't let the uh, perfect be the enemy of the good. Uh, if you're dealing with a vendor of any size or reputation, you're not going to win every uh, issue that you raise. You're going to compromise on issues, and that, that is just fine. You know, you're going to get a better contract, and that's good. The vendor that lets you uh, win every single issue is probably uh, a tiny vendor where you'll be worried. Are they so desperate for market share? Are they going to be around in six months from now? 
Uh, next, don't sign anything until you negotiate the full deal, including exhibits, uh, including things like an implementation plan and an SOW. Now, I know that for the full-blown implementation plan, maybe part of that can come post-signing, but I just had last week a client where the vendor came to them and had, it was like a two or three page kind of deal sheet that said, you know, we're going to agree on all the terms in the future and they wanted the client to sign that. Please do not sign that. Uh, once you sign that, you're potentially bound to go through with the transaction. And for the same reason that you keep, you know, a secondary or a backup vendor in the wings, that's going to keep the vendor honest and is going to keep them negotiating with you in good faith. Once you sign this preview thing, and even if it looks kind of loosey-goosey, that's going to either legally or maybe just for kind of business purpose or spirit, uh, limit your ability to walk away from the, the deal or the table. And even if you never talk about it, your ability to walk away from the deal or the table before signing is what is going to get you some of the, the bigger discounts and some of the more important legal terms that you want uh, in this transaction. All right, it's now time for us to dive into the specifics and the nitty gritty of the contracts. And uh, I work on both sides of, of licensing transactions all the time, and it is a vendor tactic uh, to, and tactic makes it sound more malicious. I should take a half a, an aside here and say, I don't think that any of the vendors are in this business to be malicious uh, or to be unethical. Uh, I do think that they're in it, especially on the legal contracting side, to make money. And uh, if they have a preference between a contract being drafted in a way that is clearly favoring you versus clearly favoring them, they're going to choose the latter. Um, and one method of achieving that result is to put important business terms in the, quote, boring legal terms. Oftentimes when I come in and start working with a client, we'll talk about a deal and they've read the contract over or the papers over. And you know, everyone has been focusing heavily, and this is appropriate, on things like the price uh, at the, you know, and uh, maybe you know, are we, which level of support are we going to get, you know, gold, silver, or platinum? Uh, you know, which models are included or modules are included in the initial purchase? Uh, what are some of the timelines in the statement of work? And those are all good and important things to be focused on. Um, and so because those are in some sense, you know, the, the price is more clear on its face, I'm not going to talk about those. Uh, in the same way as I'm not going to recommend any one vendor over another. Uh, what I am going to talk about is the terms that can have just as significant of an impact on the actual amount you write the checkout for, uh, but are, are hidden in more subtle ways. Uh, the, the painting, by the way, of the bored person, that's, uh, that, that's Edward Munch's uh, lesser-known painting, Melancholy, uh, which I know is not quite the same as boredom, but whatever. Uh, you might also be familiar, you art history buffs, with another painting by Edward Munch known as The Scream. Uh, that's, a, that's another emotion you'll probably feel at different times in this process of negotiating the contract. But for now, we'll just start with uh, boring and really trying to stay focused through the boring items. All right, uh, effective date. One of, so, so hiding important terms in the, in the definitions is one of the things you need to be careful of. Effective date is one of those things. You'll see in virtually every contract on the very top line, uh, you know, this contract is entered into effective, uh, you know, April 15th, uh, 2011. And, th and then they'll call it the quote effective date. And that term will show up throughout the project. But now let's look at a few uh, things that are happening along the way, right? So we've got negotiations happens for hopefully, you know, one to two months uh, on the legal part. There's probably been months of negotiations prior to that on uh, business terms. All right, but then after the effective date, what happens? Well, we've got some scoping and early work beginning. Uh, some deliverables begin arriving. Installation and test environment. Final testing and acceptance. And then finally at the end, go live. And in my experience, it, and there's huge variation, right? But from the beginning to the end of that process, or from the beginning of the effective date until go live, Nine months is not uh, uncommon, but again, there's huge variation. You will be putting significant or leaving significant money on the table if you focus only on the dollar amounts and rather what is the tr timing trigger that triggers the payment of various items. So let's now look at the cost elements of what can be triggered. Usually the vendors will say the effective date triggers these things. My claim is that it should not be the effective date, but other things. First, the license fee. The license fee, in my opinion, 
should never be triggered by signing because you're not getting value out of that software on the date of signing. You're not going to be using it for nine months. A general principle for me of when you should start paying for an item is when you begin to realize value from that item. And so uh, the license fee, my ideal term would be that is due and payable uh, on go live plus 30 days. The reason why I say plus 30 days is I want to make sure that it's working properly. And if there are warranty or malfunction issues during those first days, then I don't want you paying for the license fee until the thing is up and actually working properly. I can conversely write, if, you, if you're paying the license fee on the effective date, you're going to be paying for nine months of the software that you're not using in, in a proper way. Next, maintenance and support. Same thing there, uh, although I feel, you, frankly, even more. Actually, let me jump back up, license fee. I think a vendor will come back oftentimes is they'll say, well, we'll give you the, w you pay the license fee upon, quote, delivery of the software. Again, I think that I think that's a trick. I think it, it's, uh, and it, it's not a good one. Um, Again, number one, you're not uh, realizing any value on the date of delivery. There can be a huge lag time in between when it's delivered and when it goes live, especially now with you know, uh, downloadable software. You might you know, have to take delivery you know, shortly after the effective date. Also, to my view, the vendor isn't experiencing any kind of out-of-pocket costs upon delivery. Now, maybe if there's a third-party software component, that might not be entirely true. They might have to actually make payment to the third party upon a delivery date. But, but for the vendor's own proprietary software, um, uh, delivery should not be the trigger either. Next, maintenance and support. Here for sure, I even feel more strongly that it should be go live plus 30. Uh, I've even had some clients negotiate in some cases uh, that the first year is free. So they get invoiced for their first uh, maintenance and support you know, kind of uh, 12 months after go live. And the theory here is that when you're paying uh, a premium price for software, it should work pretty well for a while. And you certainly shouldn't be paying for maintenance and support when you're not even using the product. It's just in the installation period. Uh, and I think you could even make a, a possible argument, although most of my clients don't get it, but a few have, of the delaying the, you get maintenance and support, but you aren't charged for it until a ways out. Hardware. You know, hardware, because it oftentimes is provided by a third party, you probably have to pay for upon either delivery at your facility or the day that it leaves the uh, ultimate supplier of the hardware. And to my view, that's, that's relatively fair. Uh, next, services uh, such as development, uh, if there is custom development and implementation of the system. Strong preference here for milestones uh, rather than a pay-as-you-go or a time and materials approach. Then I want at least 25% held for go live or go live plus 30. And here, you know, not to say that the work that your attorney does uh, is fantastic or my work is fantastic, because of course I think it is, but for all the terms in a contract that you might negotiate, if you've got a big chunk of money hanging out there that, that the vendor has not been paid yet, that is gonna motivate them to make things right. So even if you don't have you know, term X, Y, and Z in your contract that you know, they'll improve this or improve that, uh, if you aren't writing the check and the last check is a big one, that's really going to uh, motivate and influence your vendor to correct problems, to uh, accommodate some of your other needs, and so forth, uh, and is better than, uh, better than legal terms from my point of view. All right, next, uh, hidden in the boring definitions, but I think critical to your success in this project is key personnel. And key personnel is especially sneaky because uh, the vendor is, in my experience, maybe only once out of about 40 or 50 deals has the vendor introduced this definition. Uh, usually it's you that has to add this definition as part of your uh, negotiations. A little bit of background why I think this is important. In my experience, turnover among staff uh, is one of, the, one of the more common reasons for project failure. Uh, one of my clients that was involved in litigation uh, for a failed uh, health IT project. Uh, over the course of one year, the project had about, I think it was five pro different project managers from the vendor. The vendor both had a lot of uh, staff leaving, but then also ha was growing rapidly, and so people were getting promoted and moved around all the time. Uh, is it any shock that in a large, complex IT implementation that a project with uh, five different project managers in one year had a lot of problems? 
I didn't find that shocking at all. I frankly it would have been I- impressive if, if it hadn't been riddled with problems and issues. So it is strongly in your interest to try to uh, get a good team in place to, to work with and then lock in that team. Um, now, who, who are we talking about? Because certainly there's some people who will be only playing smaller roles or lower level roles in the project where they might come and go more freely. But I think at a minimum, you want this key personnel to include the project manager. Uh, if there's a chief programmer or chief technologist who's working with you, that person. Uh, and then finally, in some cases where there's a lot of training, I think it can be useful to have a chief trainer or a lead trainer named because if you're going to have uh, multiple training sessions, right, that person's going to learn the particularities of your business uh, in a way that if you get a new person each week or each month, uh, they're not going to know. You can even name specific people if you know who you want to work with uh, in the deal. So now that we've talked about who, who we should list under key personnel, what do we do with that? Well, we should have certain rights with regards to those key personnel. Uh, most importantly, that they stay assigned to our project uh, unless they leave the company. Now, there are always going to be exceptions, right? If the person leaves, uh, they can't stop that. Uh, if the person goes on a maternity or paternity leave, has a serious health issue, all those sorts of things uh, cannot be avoided, and those are exceptions. But so long as the person is employed by the company, by the vendor, they should stay working on your project. Next, in the case when someone does leave, for example, in the case they leave the company, uh, you want the right to interview and approve their replacement to make sure that you're happy with these most important people. Vendor pays for catch-up or delay. Let's imagine that you get a new project manager uh, you know, six months into a project because the previous person retired. Um, my view is that that, and, and here I'd ask you, know, you, the client, or your internal lead on the project, how long is it going to take the, the replacement to get up to speed on this project? Is it two weeks, three weeks, four weeks uh, of kind of replacement or catch-up learning? If you're paying for your project and services on a time and materials basis or in any way that is related to time, when the vendor has replaced a position due to something that is not your fault, such as either you know a, a retirement uh, or leaving the company by an employee, they should pay for those two or three weeks for the new person to get, to get up to speed, not you, in my view. Next, sort of a related item, uh, although it's less key personnel, customer that's you may require removal of any vendor personnel for performance reasons, such as a weak skills or improper behavior. You just always want that right, uh, that if somebody is doing a bad job, you want the ability to kind of insist that they be replaced. All right, Uh, definition, documentation. This definition will be in most agreements that you see from the beginning. And this definition is critical because this is the one that's going to drive the performance warranty. Uh, And and the performance warranty is what uh, is, that's really where the rubber meets the road in terms of are you going to get what you think you're paying for. Here's the the bad bullet point. Here's what most vendors will offer you in their first round of document, uh, uh, their first round document or agreement. Documentation means vendors, user manuals posted on, you know, vendor.com as updated from time to time. What's wrong with that? Well, the first is I circled the words user manuals. Those things are probably written in technical jargon and mumbo jumbo. Remember how I said earlier I want an RFP that says in plain English what you expect and need the system to do? The, the vendor's user manuals almost certainly do not contain that. And if they do, it's buried in there somewhere. And I'm sure you probably have not looked at those manuals. So it's, just, it's not a useful reference if when there's a warranty problem later on down the road, the system isn't doing X, you want to be able to point to a specific piece of paper or a sentence that says, you said it will do this, it's not doing that. If you've got to dig through some user manual, uh, it's, it's a much tougher process and you probably won't find what you want and certainly not as clearly as you want. I've had a few cases where the, uh, where the vendors have come back to me and said, well, you know, we're really convinced that everything that you listed of your, you know, your, your 20 most important functionality issues in the RFP we're not going to include the RFP response because all those are included within the uh, user manual. I've challenged the vendors to say, okay, you know what? Don't make me do that homework. You go do that homework. Let's just pick five of those things. Show me which pages of the user manual those, f- uh, those five particular functionalities are listed on. And either they've, they've failed to do it or they've come back with, with responses that were clearly so loosey-goosey and mumbo-jumbo that everyone acknowledged that the user manuals were just not useful for this purpose. Next, I circled the vendor.com. We're taking the time to negotiate a legal contract, 
And when you've got a cross-reference to a website that you don't control, that means that the user manuals and the terms can change there. It's what I call the moving target problem. You're paying enough money that you shouldn't have to worry that they're going to change or dumb down their user manuals in a, in a week from now or a year from now. So anytime that there's a cross-reference to uh, you know, terms on a website, uh, I start strongly recommend that you just delete that out and say, you know what, uh, let's just attach it to the contract or give a more definitive cross-reference. So now let's go down to the, to the good example I gave. Right, documentation means the vendor user, user manuals, we can still include those, uh, but then dated you know, on a particular date uh, and attached ideally, but then also vendor's RFP response and the date of that response all sales materials or similar items or information provided by vendor to customer describing the software slash system, its functionalities and performance, and all the specifications and similar items attached here to or to any SOW or similar documentation. Now you might not get all of that. What I'm trying to do here is gather up all those things that the salespeople or others told you about how awesome their system is going to be. If their salespeople are telling you that you and you've relied on that and making your vendor selection, it should be part of the legal contract. Now, again, you might compromise on certain items, so it's not every sales email that you received. But if it were me, again, I might compromise on some of the sales stuff, but I do for sure want, uh, you know, if they've given me a brochure that describes the product, I want that attached. Uh, I want the RFP response attached. Uh, one final thought here. Uh, I've seen with regard to some documentation, uh, I can't, actually I saw this recently, uh, that the vendor tried to claim that, and this is a smaller vendor, that the system was provided, quote, as is. And I just about fell over when I saw that. Uh, you know, we're not buying bicycles on Craigslist here. We're buying a really expensive software system. If you see that kind of a uh, warranty disclaimer that, oh, we're not going to warrant to the documentation because we're providing the software as is, um, that's, that's not even close to acceptable uh, from my point of view. All right, next, uh, next area of definitions, users. Uh, so the users, and here what I'm really talking about is not just the users, but whatever is the metric that you and the vendor are counting that drives fees and drives how many people can use the system. So it might be seats, it might be you know, on clicks per procedure or exam or records, whatever the different metric or metrics are that you're using. And the thing I tell my clients here is, you know, if all goes well, which hopefully it will, the vast majority of this contract is going to sit in a drawer and collect dust and no one will ever refer back to it. Except, I assure you, uh, that, that folks on the vendor staff are going to go back and revisit the definition of users uh, and they're going to come back and check in with you in case they're entitled to more fees because your volume of use has grown in future years. So the, the particulars of how you count uh, are, are exceptionally important. So next, uh, be very careful, be very precise. I also would like to see an example in kind of plain English uh, describing how people or seats or users are counted. Next, let's imagine that you're over by a few folks, right? You've got a license for uh, 50 providers to use the system. Uh, and you know what, because you've got, you just added a branch office, some people came, some people left, but you happen to have 53 users at a particular time. I wanna see a contract term that says the exclusive remedy for an overage is a true up. In other words, you know, you pay for the three additional licenses. Why is this so important? Uh, because if you don't have that in there, you're exposed to two other consequences. One is it could just be viewed as a breach of contract. And under breach of contract, they can terminate the license usually. And termination of the license means that your entire investment in this goes down the toilet. For having three people extra using the system on for a couple weeks does not merit losing your overall gigantic investment in this product. So that's just not appropriate. Secondly, under copyright law and with software licenses, that's the body of law we're dealing with. The law provides that uh, statutory damages of 30 to 50, or excuse me, 30 to $150,000 per instance of copyright violation. And having too many people using a software system, and there are cases out there that say this, that is a form of copyright violation. Both of those results are totally disproportionate and not appropriate. So please have a true up as the remedy if you happen to go over on your count. Next, uh, how are we counting? Who should be excluded from the count? Uh, should certain types of users or providers uh, or seats be excluded? Examples, you know, residents, should they count? Uh, I know that some practices that have uh, physicians then also have mental health providers 
because the mental health providers bill out at a, at a significantly lower rate. Uh, they were not counted for a full seat. They were counted at, at, a, at a fraction of a full seat for counting purposes. So think through if there are people who, as you're uh, negotiating the, the price, whether the people who are going to be using your system that maybe you shouldn't be paying for or shouldn't be paying for in full. Definition of licensee or the license itself. A uh, couple thoughts here. First, make sure that it permits use by your affiliates or branch offices. Oftentimes, uh, particularly in this industry area, uh, you don't have a parent and a sub, although sometimes you do, but oftentimes you'll have kind of sister organizations that have common ownership or similar ownership. Whatever the arrangement is that you have with your other offices or affiliates, you need to make it very clear in either the definition of the licensee or in the grant of the license that you're not violating the license by letting somebody else uh, use it. Next, um, make sure that you permit use by your independent contractors, not just employees. Again, technically those are third parties. So if the license says uh, you agree, licensee, to use this system only yourself and will not permit use by any third party, what does that mean? That means that you can't let your independent contractors use it. And that is probably going to limit uh, what you thought you were going to be able to do with this system. Next, uh, you should permit hosting by an off-site uh, third party. That's, but even if you're not going to do that from day one, uh, outsourcing some of your IT function is growing increasingly common. That can be to a, uh, uh, an IT hosting facility uh, across town, in the cloud, in the foreign country, whatever the case might happen to be. And you want it explicit that if you want to load your software onto a server that's owned by somebody else, that's not a breach of your contract. Where I have this show up in real life is I've had a number of vendors come back and say, oh, you're going to move it to a different facility. Well, there's a $5,000, $10,000 kind of transfer fee, or they kind of make up some fee, and you don't want to get tagged with that fee. The license. The, the core... Uh, Probably the core of this transaction is the license that's granted to the technology. The first example I give here is, although it's a little bit of condensed, what I call the standard vendor version. So long as licensee, that's you, is in full compliance with this agreement, licensor, that's the vendor, hereby grants to licensee a limited, non-exclusive, non-transferable license to use the software in licensee's business. You know, it doesn't seem so outrageous, but let's look at how I'd recommend we revise, we revise this. So I struck out the first sentence, uh, or the first phrase, so long as licensee is in full compliance with this agreement. Well, you know, if you're engaged in some minor breach, and, uh, you know, what's the minor breach? Again, you know, you're over by one or two people in terms of your seat count or something. That shouldn't uh, lead to a termination of the license. So that's just not appropriate. Next is uh, licensor hereby grants to licensee. And let's add some words, right? Let's add affiliates, agents, hosting service, consultants, business partners, all the folks that might use this so that you're not in breach by letting them use the system. Uh, then we'll continue a limited, non-exclusive, uh, non-transferable. Then I've added, except as set forth later on. Again, I've had clients who have been hit with a kind of an assignment fee or some kind of a transfer fee when all they've done is they've merged with another uh, facility or clinic. They've done a corporate reorganization where everything is still the same, but they've that they've formed a new entity. These would all call uh, kind of legal, technical governance changes where really the way that you're using the software isn't changing at all, but now the vendor's coming to you because the technical legal entity using the software has changed and they're going to ask for, for a toll or for some money from you. Then the license. If you're going to use or modify the software, you want that right to be explicit, so we potentially add those words. And then closing, right, software in licensee's business. Um, if you're providing services to your affiliates, we want to expand that definition there to specifically include them. Now, let me look over at uh, my colleagues who are helping me with this uh, webinar right now and say, have we had any uh, questions come in so far? All right. Uh, well, I'll assume, uh, perhaps selfishly, that that's because I'm providing useful information. I hope that's true. But if there are things that you have in mind that I have not answered so far, I may well get to them. But particularly on things we've talked about, please do feel free to send in questions. Confidentiality. Uh, as we've seen, this has been a focus uh, lately of some enforcement actions, right? We've seen uh, government, um, especially in the health arena, paying attention and handing out some rather hefty fines. So we want to make sure that we deal with this because uh, those of us in the industry know, uh, 
your internal security and confidentiality is important, but actually one of the most common ways that you get security and confidentiality and privacy breaches is by your third-party vendors. So we need a good term. What I find that my health clients are fantastic about is, uh, is PHI and the HIPAA Business Associate Agreement. So we all know in these cases that we're going to have a PHI and a Business Associate Agreement. But that's not the whole story. All right. Uh, PHI is only a subset of the confidential information that we want protected here. Uh, there's a bunch of other stuff that would not be covered by a BAA that I think you want a clause that addresses this does cover. Things such as the identity and number of your employees, a uh, number of procedures you perform, your fees and your financial arrangements, uh, possibly information regarding aggregate or de-identified data, business plans. Again, all those things will be not protected unless you have a general confidentiality clause. Now I'm going to look over at uh, one of my health law colleagues who joined in recently with a uh, question. And um, is that Katie? Do you want this, is, this is Katie Burkhart, a member of our health law group, who kindly agreed to uh, join and is our reader for questions. So Katie, I'm just going to let you jump in with this one that we have right now. OK, so this question is um, pretty general. But as we're talking about all of these terms you're suggesting, this person wants to know, how likely is it that a vendor is going to be willing to negotiate on these items. Um, their experience, the question year's experience, is that they're not willing to negotiate on much. So, you know, that's a fantastic question, right? Because what's the point of this whole exercise that we're spending together if I'm telling you pie in the sky things? Um, I will tell you that everything I have asked for right now, I have gotten in some form or another. And I'll say that I consistently get. Uh, as I said, you've got to pick your battles and you won't win all of them. Uh, let me just kind of go back and pick a, um, I'll pick uh, maybe one or two examples quickly. The scope of the license. Um, I will bet that every single deal I work on, I get some clarifications to the scope of the license uh, to make it clear that some of these things that, that you, the customer, are expecting, such as use by your affiliates, by some of your independent contractor docs, uh, to make it clear that you're not going to have to pay extra fees or penalties for those folks. Next, uh, I'll give the example under users, the true up for overage. I will say I get that uh, as opposed to having some of the other like breach or uh, copyright damages. I get that, I'll say, 80% of the time. Um, so there are, there are certain things that I agree with you that sometimes the vendors will not move on. But, uh, and I've also been surprised and inter interested, frankly, that including some of the biggest vendors, I mean, you know, the, the Epics, the GEs, the McKessons, and, and so forth, um, you know, again, we don't get everything, but the contract that we end with looks dramatically different than the contract that we started with. I've been, frankly, pleasantly surprised. Uh, actually, here I'll just single out GE. Uh, I've found GE has been a really good negotiator, uh, and I'm not endorsing them, but I'm just saying that recently I was impressed at the uh, level of revisions that they would make. Um, sometimes I've found smaller businesses uh, that are kind of scared to change their template contract. Uh, a little bit more reticent to make changes. Uh, also, as I mentioned at the very beginning, if you're really rushed, uh, sometimes the vendor will just say, you know what, we're going to focus only on price with you and not these le boring legal terms um, in order to meet the rush deadline. But that's, uh, that's a great question. But nothing, I'm not going to suggest anything at all during this webinar that I would say is outrageous or totally undoable. Uh, now, I, we might suggest things that you'll scale back from, but nothing that's totally absurd. All right, uh, good question, thank you. All right, choice of law and venue. Again, boring. Uh, you're now seeing a map, and you're going to see the red states. No political uh, commentary here. Those are, for me, the, the, the states where I'm a little bit nervous about accepting their choice of law and venue. Uh, here we are in Minnesota. That's a green. I feel always happy about that. But, you know, there's also, uh, I'm showing a green now, a green in Delaware, a green in New York. Those are good compromise states. Oh, I'm going to go back now. There we go. Um, those are all, uh, New York and Delaware are fine compromises. Let me break this apart into two pieces. Choice of law means whose law books you pull off the shelf if you're going to have a dispute. And honestly, most states' laws are going to be uh, generally acceptable for these purposes. Again, California and Louisiana. Louisiana, I probably would never accept. California, because there's so many tech companies based out there, it would not be my first choice or even my second choice, but I would accept it. But now, by way of contrast, venue. And let's, let's circle venue. Venue means where you're going to go to have the fight. 
uh, if you have to have a fight, or whose courthouse do you walk into? This is critically important, because if your vendor is based in California or Illinois or New York, wherever, and, um, and you actually have to travel to their courthouse and hire a lawyer there to have a dispute, in my experience, clients will end up walking away or uh, letting go disputes worth up to about $100,000. Uh, so in other words, you're kind of putting $100,000 on the table because that's kind of what it costs to walk in the door and start a lawsuit in this foreign jurisdiction. Whereas if we're in Minnesota for the venue, uh, Katie and I can literally see the, the, the federal and state courthouses right out of our windows. So that's a much less expensive thing that you have to do. Vendors might hem and haw, but again, I've seen large vendors agree to Minnesota uh, choice of law and venue because they're doing business in all 50 states anyways. They've got people here on the ground. Um, you know, I'm guessing that you, if you're the client, you would never have, you don't regularly go to California on business purposes, whereas uh, the, the vendors might regularly be in Minnesota. So again, I think this is an issue that you can win, but not always. I'm gonna hit one or two more uh, terms and then we're gonna go uh, answer some more questions. Limitation of liability. What's the vendor going to offer you? Uh, oftentimes, they're going to try to limit their uh, liability in every possible way, and the clause will be one-sided, favoring only them. It'll say things like direct damages only, uh, limit to amounts uh, paid in the previous 12 months. Again, this is an area where uh, every single vendor that offers you the one-sided, uh, lopsided clause should be making at least some revisions. Here's what I'd like to see. Right. First of all, you just go mutual across the board. Uh, you can agree to some limits. So on the left-hand side, you know, when should their li liability be limited to things like direct damages or fees paid? Well, if the system does not work the way you want it to and you're unhappy, you want to return it, probably it's fair that their maximum exposure is fees paid or something close to it. But let's look on the right-hand side for the exclusions. These are cases where, in my view, there's potential catastrophic liability for you where limitations of liability should not apply. Uh, and frankly, from my view, this is where the vendor should just have insurance. Uh, if they breach your confidentiality or security, right, you could potentially be paying a whole lot more uh, or deal with claims or damage to your business be up and above and beyond what the system costs. And for those, the, the cap should not apply. Uh, indemnity, that's where a third party sues you because something went wrong with the system. Uh, and then possibly some warranties, such as compliance with laws. Next, we're going to turn to warranties, uh, which are, again, a core area because this is what ensures that you can hold the vendor's feet to the fire and it, the thing will do uh, what you expect it to do. But first, I'm going to look over at Katie. Do we have another question? Yeah, this is along the same lines of negotiations. Uh, Steve, would your approach be different with a, uh, a reseller, a company that's selling a product on behalf of a or from a larger company versus a direct contract with the actual vendor? So that's, you know, that, that's a, a, another excellent question. These are, these are good questions and hard questions. So here's, here's the deal. Uh, adding a reseller will add potentially a layer of complication because oftentimes or sometimes a reseller will kind of play the role of this buffer that is harder to negotiate with the original vendor or the, kind of the software or system provider. So I'll say it adds a layer of complication um, most of the deals that I deal with are directly going to the primary vendor. Uh, so I, I guess I'll just say strategy will change um, because there may be things in a reseller relationship that are just going to be uh, either off limits to negotiate or much, much harder to negotiate. So you as the customer have to decide whether whatever the benefit is of, of using the reseller is worth it because it, it will be harder to negotiate some of these underlying terms. That, that good question leads to a, a side comment of things I'm not talking about uh, in this webinar, and that is going back to vendor selection. Probably your choice of vendor, again, not that I don't think what we're doing is important today because it's how I make my living and I think it's very important, but, but your vendor selection is so, so critical. Uh, you know, there are a lot of players, some of them may not be around, might go bankrupt in the next two, three, four years. There's different levels of quality of systems. Uh, there's systems that are more appropriate for different uh, types of providers. And so uh, those sorts of business level questions, who are you dealing with, uh, are, are important to raise and are just beyond probably the scope of what I as your lawyer here today can answer. All right, warranties, will it work? Uh, so first, 
tied to the RFP and documentation. We talked about that earlier. Next, be very specific. Both if you end up in court, heaven forbid, or frankly, on a more practical level, just for peer negotiations when you're, when you're calling up the vendor and saying, hey, uh, our system's not doing X, we need it to do X, your ability to get fast action will be greatly enhanced if you can point to a specific piece of paper that says, here's where you say it will do X and it's not doing X. Uh, right, it should be in plain English, not jargon. Spell out remedies for failure. This one will be a hard one to negotiate. Uh, it's always worth asking. Sometimes you'll get it. Sometimes you'll get a variation of it. Um, if there is significant failure of the system and it's not performing some key functions, in my view, the first remedy or choice should be that the vendor gets a chance to cure and correct, right? So they get to try to fix it. But at some point, they have to stop trying. If it's still not working properly and it's a significant functionality or it's the whole system, then their time to correct runs out. And at that point, in my view, you are entitled or should be entitled just on a business level to, to all your money back. Because frankly, your real costs are going to include your own labor and time. I wouldn't even spend time trying to ask for those because I think you'll, you'll never get that as well. But it's showing that you'll be out a lot. Uh, and so you should get all of your fees back, right? The software license fee, any maintenance and support, uh, et cetera. The challenge here is the word refund is a toxic word for vendors. Uh, they, they don't like the word, and they'll sometimes throw back at you the phrase revenue recognition. And uh, this is where account they'll say, look, our accountants won't let us book the revenue if there is this refund term. Here, again, we're going to risk drilling down too far, but I'll say this. Do not let that be the end of negotiations uh, or let that rule the, day, rule the day. Number one, revenue recognition and when they book the revenue I is their problem and not yours. And in the case of a catastrophic, tra catastrophic failure, it's not going to help you uh, explain to your colleagues or partners that uh, you can't get your money back because of some revenue recognition issue that the vendor had. The other is that... When business people throw out that term, I think they do it a little bit loosey-goosey to just kind of stop or freeze negotiations on an issue. Uh, in reality, the accountants do have some wiggle room, and even if you don't use words like refund, uh, which, which is a kind of a toxic word, there are words that mean about the same thing, such as liquidated damages in the amount of all fees paid that I think can achieve the same purpose. All right, what else do we want from warranties? Uh, system will perform as described. Oh, let's see. Here we go. In the documentation, we've got that. Vendor has all rights necessary. The software will not infringe any IP rights. Vendor will comply with all laws. Uh, vendor will perform with uh, reasonable skill and care. Those are all reasonable, um, and I think you should be able to get those. Continuing, you'll this top one here, you'll never see the vendors offer all by themselves. The vendor will comply with privacy and security policies. But that's important, and I think it's reasonable to ask. Uh, now, they'll say things like, well, we want to see them in advance, and I would say, sure, give them a copy in advance. This next one always floors me. Uh, system will accurately process and store data. Here's what I mean by this. Uh, if on Monday you enter uh, you know, in, a, in a record in an EMR system, Steve Helland is 42 years old uh, and is allergic to penicillin, on Tuesday I should still be 42 years old and allergic to penicillin. My age shouldn't change, and this yes-no field should not change. Um, vendors push back on this. I'll say I get this less than half the time, but it always amazes me because I think, why in the world wouldn't they be willing to represent and warrant that? Now, what vendors will push back with, back with is they'll say, look, it's your job on the front lines as, as the provider to make care decisions, and, and we are not a healthcare provider and that ultimately the doc or the provider is the last line of quality control and safety. And that may be true, but I still think that, again, let's say that you got the piece about penicillin wrong um, or the, the, the allergy wrong. That's not always going to be caught. And I can understand that software might not be up 100% of the time, that there might be other issues, but this kind of what I'll call data integrity, um, I think is something that you should expect. I'd like to see more cl customers asking for so that it becomes more standard. No virus or malicious code pass-through of all third-party warranties. Oh, I should add one more here. Let's add a brand new one, which is that the system will interoperate, which just means you kind of talk to and function with the third-party software it's intended to interoperate with. All these systems are going to have not just the core uh, vendor software, but a variety of other systems and tools it'll talk with, and you want that included in your warranties. All right. 
uh, show me the money, right? High Tech Act certification. Uh, everybody should have this. And again, uh, big vendors will give this. I've had some small vendor pushback, but by major players, uh, I, I can always get this, assuming that it's true for the particular product. The software is certified EHR technology. Now, I want to get as well and shall remain certified EHR technology. That you can have some back and forth on, but I've still gotten variations of that. Next, if you're signing up and paying uh, for maintenance and support, and that can be in the range typically of 15 to 20% per year of the primary license fee, you should be getting updates and upgrades for free at no additional cost. And to me, that includes uh, to stage two under the High Tech Act certification. And the reason why I, I flush that out is because Sometimes you'll have vendors make this distinction between uh, uh, updates to software, you know, quote, updates that which are included in what you get for maintenance and support versus, quote, upgrades, which are supposedly some kind of a bigger jump and they sometimes reserve the right to price separately for. So as an, as an IT person will tell you, uh, those are totally arbitrary categories. And, you know, what's the difference between you know, 10.1 and 10.2 versus going to 11.0 or 11.1. That's just within the business what they want to do and when they want to try to charge more money. Uh, if you are taking the time and effort to pay for software and support, I don't care whether it's an update or an upgrade for their internal nomenclature uh, or, uh, you know, moving from a 10.0 to an 11.0, you should get it for free. Indemnification, we're running short on time. I'll just say that those of you who have dealt with this before know that this is what lo lawyers love to argue about. This is the clause that's going to give you coverage if a third party sues you. Uh, that third party could be a patient. It could also be a rival vendor. I just saw actually in the paper today uh, in a trade publication that there's litigation going on between uh, Epic and McKesson. And um, if you purchased one of those and not the other, um, you don't want to get named as a co-party by uh, Epic in their lawsuit against McKesson. Maintenance and support, be clear what you get. Uh, you also want not only what you get, but the, what you have the choice of saying no to. Uh, sometimes there are, are updates that you want to decline because it adds a functionality that is not important to you or your practice, but would require a ton of time for your IT folks to install. One of the things I'll also negotiate sometimes, and vendors will sometimes agree to this, is that a major upgrade will only come once per year because you don't want your folks to be, uh, your IT folks will appreciate this in a state of kind of constant revolution where you're getting new updates and upgrades all the time and all they are doing is installing new versions. And that requires a ton of ancillary effort to build these bridges to the third party software and tools that the system is supposed to talk to. Next, uh, option to continue support for up to seven years. You don't want to buy a product that's going to be sunset next year or in two years. Um, this can be a little tricky, but again, uh, I've gotten things pretty close to this. Five years most vendors will agree to, I've found. Th as we close in on our final minutes, I'm going to uh, move quickly through the last couple of slides, but we're actually doing pretty good on timing and issues. What if my vendor files for bankruptcy or goes out of business? That's bad news, uh, not surprisingly. Uh, sometimes you can do a source code escrow, but again, this goes back to just the importance of vendor selection. There's some legal things you can do to help in this situation, but frankly, uh, they aren't a huge help. Payment of fees. Uh, the general principle here is, as we talked about when I had my kind of uh, go live versus uh, implementation or effective date, um, I really prefer milestones versus pay as you go. Uh, I want to see te testing and acceptance. And I want to see a, a, a sizable chunk of money held until the whole system is up and running and working properly to motivate the vendor. Also think about the future. I want to see a cap on increases. Uh, CPI, the consumer price index is common. Uh, maybe it's CPI plus two, two or three percent. But the thing that you, you know, if you're, if you're going to have to buy additional custom services in the future, you don't want the rates for their hourly rates for their employees uh, time to go up by 25 percent in the next two years. All right, we'll close out with this one, uh, fees and travel. This is, again, a sneaky thing because it seems kind of innocuous. These can be huge. Uh, if folks are coming out uh, from any distance away, I've seen fees for travel and expenses go north of 25% of all professional services fees, and they have shocked in a, in a not good way some clients. Uh, so notice some of the, the details, right? So let's be attaching a travel policy. For example, travel time. 
is any time a vendor is getting on the airplane, you're getting dinged for a full day of their time, you know, kind of eight or 10 hours or the equivalent. Maybe you want to negotiate that down. Uh, next, consider a cap, uh, require following a travel policy. And my last uh, go get the money uh, tip for this presentation is, especially if you're going to be having a decent number of, of hotel nights, call up whoever your kind of most, uh, your number one vendor, keeping number two and three in reserve, ask them what their discount is with the hotel uh, hotels, the business class hotels you're by. So they'll probably say, you know, 30 to 40 percent typically. Then you call up those, uh, one, you know, call up one of those hotels and say, hey, if you can do, you know, 10 or 15 percent better, I will name you as the hotel. Uh, that's going to save you ten thousand uh, dollars plus or minus of, depending upon the size of the deal and frankly it's going to take about one to two hours of your time all right uh, I've got a Wall Street Journal article small businesses cut cost by renegotiation this actually maybe ties into the first question um, in this environment people are looking for market share even the big guys want market share uh, the small folks want to stay in the game uh, you do have an opportunity to negotiate both on the things that are obvious, like price, but also the sneaky, boring terms that will have a significant impact on the outcome. Thank you very much. And do we have any more questions? I don't think so. I thank you, Steve, for um, always being our expert on the intersection of IT and the law. Um, I will put in a plug for next month. May 11th is our next webinar. And as many of you listening probably know, the uh, Accountable Care Organization regulations came out last week um, in their 400-page form. And so we will be synthesizing that and going through what hospitals and clinics need to know about the proposed rules, what's important, what's fluff, um, and how to plan moving forward. So join us for that on May 11th. And um, again, if you have questions after the presentation, please feel free um, to contact Steve directly. Um, or you can email one of us or call our number, but Steve is, is the guru, guru here. And, oh, I am seeing one question, and maybe we'll just take it here. Uh, all right, Steve, this is a specific question on what does pass through all third parties' warranties mean? Uh, great question. So that means if there are third party warranties, uh, if, there, if there's third party software, that software probably comes with warranties. Uh, such as, you know, it'll perform for documentation or it doesn't infringe third parties' uh, IP, et cetera. If you are getting either a reseller or somebody else is buying that for you, you want a contract term that says you get the benefit of those warranties. If you don't have that pass-through term, then if the third party software doesn't function properly, you call up that third party and, you know, you call up Adobe and say, hey, there's a problem. Uh, they might say to you, we don't know who you are. We, we don't have a contract with you. Go away. Uh, and so the pass-through will allow you to have some rights. On that point, I think we're all done for today. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.